Well, good morning, and um, welcome to the live stream from the research vessel Falcor, um, operated by the Schmidt Ocean Institute, currently operating in the Gulf of California, and more specifically in the South Pescadero Basin of the Gulf of California. Um, ROV Sebastian is descending. It has reached a depth of 2,461 meters and it's descending onto a site called the Auka Hydrothermal Vent Field. And this is ROV Sebastian dive 467, 467. And um, what we are going to be doing today is a combination of activities at the Auka hydrothermal vent field starting with some water sampling probably a little bit of, of rock sampling um, and then we will move up to pick up onto a heat flow transect that was done in 2018 during a prior expedition of the Falcor and we're going to extend that heat flow transect um, well to the west of the vent field. Um, so the first part will be um, working around uh, vents themselves and then we will begin doing the heat flow measurements along uh, along a line defined by a um, sub-bottom profile, an image of the subsurface that we have was collected on um, from an autonomous underwater vehicle back also in 2018. Um, and as we uh, work our way along that transect, we will be moving hundreds of meters to the west of the vent field. Uh, so this is very similar to what we've been doing for the last, uh, for the prior four days um, during this expedition or leg two of this expedition. And um, the difference is that instead of working at the Yakma Ja'ag hydrothermal vent field, today we are at the Auka vent field. The expedition that this is part of is designated FK210922 and uh, is entitled Interdisciplinary Investigation of Hydrothermal Vents in the South Pescadero Basin, Gulf of California. And um, on the stream, I, I believe currently um, we're showing uh, a three-dimensional perspective visualization of the topography of part of the the um, South Pescadero Basin. It's showing topography deri that derives from uh, multiple means of mapping the seafloor at multiple scales. So zooming out as it is right now, uh, the broader view is provided by bathymetry collected using a multi-beam sonar on the hull of RV Falcor. And so with the ship, we drive around and mow the lawn, as, as the term is, um, and cover the seafloor at a resolution that varies with water depth, but uh, in, the, in this area is on the order of perhaps 15 to 30 meters in lateral resolution, the 30 meters being um, the resolution you achieve at the depths of the basin, at, at, 37, 3,800 meters. Um, and as, as John is zooming way out, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> ah, we've, we've got biology. So we'll, we'll come back to the bathymetry, but we have, we have found some biology here and the pilots are uh, focusing in on it and focusing and focused in on it and um, is this a tinafor? It's a tinafor? It is a tinafor. I win. Um, I got one right. Um, I am, um, this is 
David Caress, um, chief scientist uh, of this expedition, of, of this um, leg two of this expedition. And um, I am a geophysicist, and I am a software engineer, and I am not a biologist. And so, um, much as I enjoy disturbing the animals as anyone else, um, I don't know that much about them. Um, and that was, of course, really, really cool, as uh, the Tina 4 is endeavoring to get away from ROV Sebastian. A wise move. So off it goes and down we go. Um, now, flying the vehicle at this point this morning, um, we have our chief pilot, J-Rod, and, and uh, um, another pilot, Chris. And um, as, as they're um, descending, what's going on at, at, up on the ship, there is a winch that is paying out the tether that connects us in the control room down to the robot, the ROV. And that winch is paying out the tether at a pretty constant rate. Um, and what um, J-Rod just did was to pause the vehicle going down long enough to get some footage of that Tina 4. Uh, but the winch kept paying out. And then, um, so a little bit of slack developed. And then J-Rod, um, when we stopped filming the Tina 4, um, he took off back down at a faster rate and is catching up with the tether. And so we can pause our descent a little bit, but it doesn't actually add any time to the overall descent time, which is going to take um, a total of about two hours and 15 minutes or so to get down to the, um, the sea floor at about 3,470 meters depth. So we're back into viewing um, some of the uh, topography here. And in view at the moment, you see two patches of bathymetry um, at two different scales. So you see the larger patch and then the, the smaller patch. And so the larger patch there is showing meter scale bathymetry that was collected using an autonomous underwater vehicle. And that's, that's actually my side of this overall project. I'm the, the seafloor mapping person. Um, and I lead the seafloor mapping team at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And so in 2012 and 2015 and, and um, on Embari ships and, and in 2018 here on the Falcor, um, we've operated autonomous underwater vehicles in the Gulf of California. Uh, mapping the seafloor of, of areas uh, that will typically be something like three kilometers by six kilometers in a single 19-hour mission, um, mapping those at, at one meter scale using a multi-beam sonar that's part of the payload of an autonomous underwater vehicle or AUV. We fly those vehicles at about 50 meter altitude with about 150 meter survey line spacing and again achieve uh, meter scale bathymetry. So that was the, um, the most of the view that you were looking at. And then there was a um, there was a um, another patch that we will look at in a bit that was smaller and in fact is higher resolution. And that's some surveys that we did off of ROV Sebastian operating very close to the seafloor in the, um, the expedition we had on this ship right here in 2018. So the Auka vent field uh, that we're descending onto 
was discovered in 2015. And the way that happened was that we were doing AUV surveys in the South Pescadero Basin with Mbari's mapping AUVs. And um, we found um, in those surveys that there were some features that appeared to be hydrothermal vent chimneys and edifices. Um, and that was then followed up on later in that same Mbari expedition uh, by, an R by ROV dives from our, our second ship that was part of that expedition. Um, the, and the vent field was, was discovered and, and um, ver it was verified that there was active venting there. And so since that time, since 2015, um, this vent field's been visited um, multiple times, um, including by us, um, by this um, science team um, on the Falcor in 2018. So if we can um, zoom in on the ROV surveys, John, that would be great. John's our lead marine tech here on, um, on the Falcor. And there, um, no, that's a, that's a good view. Um, so here we are, um, Let's see. So that's the AUV view. You have the uh, the the ROV bathymetry. Yeah, there we go. Because that's that's right in the um, the AUCA field. So, oop. Um, oh, okay. So th this is the screen I need to be looking at, right, John? This one? Yeah, okay. I was just looking at the wrong screen. Okay, so what you see there is, is a region that was covered um, by doing a survey with ROV Sebastian in 2018. Um, that represents about 30 hours of bottom time. Um, on that trip, we, had, we brought extra ROV pilots so that we could run 24 hours a day. Um, and um, what, what was mounted onto Sebastian is what we call the Ambari Low Altitude Survey System, and it combines a 400 kilohertz multi-beam sonar, it combines a LIDAR laser scanner, so this is a true LIDAR, a, a time of flight laser scanner. Um, that is, we call it the wide swath LIDAR because it has an unusually wide field of view, 90 degrees, which lets us map a swath that's twice the altitude wide. And we, we fly the ROV at a three meter altitude when we're doing that, which is close enough to take pictures. So we also have a stereo camera rig as part of this, this um, survey system and we can do photo mosaicing and then, then actually photogrammetry from the stereo pairs with that. What you're looking at right now is the bathymetry from the multi-beam sonar, which is a five centimeter scale. And then from the LIDAR, we get centimeter scale bathymetry. The photographs we take with the, the stereo cameras um, have a, a native pixel resolution of about two and a half millimeters or so at a three meter altitude. Um, so again, what, what you see there is a result of about 30 hours of ROB on bottom time. Um, if we have eight hours on bottom, uh, we will run again at a three meter altitude, we'll move the ROV at about um, 0.2 meters per second, and we wind up covering an area of about 100 meters by 100 meters in about eight hours of bottom time. With the um, AUVs doing that mapping, um, we, we have batteries in the AUVs sufficient to do a mission of about 19 hours. 
Of course, the AUV has to get to the bottom, so it has to descend and has to come back from the, the mission at, at the end. Um, so it has to ascend um, in, um, in these fairly significant depths of 3,700 meters or so. Then um, we get about 70 kilometers of track line. Um, and we're, we're covering a swath width of about 170 meters. We run a 150 meter line spacing to get overlap. Um, and we'll cover a, an area of about three kilometers by five kilometers in that mission. Um, typically, uh, nowadays, we will run two of those AUVs simultaneously. We'll be doing that work on an upcoming Embari expedition here in the Gulf of California in, um, starting in mid-January. And uh, the AUV work will go through to the end of February. And then we'll have a second ship. That'll be on RV Rachel Carson. Um, RV Western Flyer will come down in February to do ROV operations with our ROV dock rickets. Um, and so we will be doing the AUV mapping in, um, off the Carson in January and February. We'll be doing some midwater AUV work in, in February. And then the focus will switch to the ROV operations off the Western Flyer. There's seven legs of those ROV operations um, encompassing a, a wide variety of activities, midwater biology, benthic biology, marine chemistry, um, and there will also be um, geology at hydrothermal event fields, including um, some of the low altitude survey uh, mapping activities, um, and that will be followed up, um, that mapping will be followed up with uh, a, um, a biology, ecology, and microbiology uh, leg that will involve substantially the same folks that are going to be here on the Falcor for leg three of this expedition. Um, led, the next leg for our expedition will be led by um, Victoria Orphan of Caltech, um, joined by Shauna Gofredi of Occidental College, Greg Rouse of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, um, Rob Zurenberg of UC Davis, who's here with us in the room right now on this leg, and um, all of the members of their teams. Um, so they'll be following up our dives um, here on the Falcor, and then we have the opportunity to do to continue all of this work off of the Embari vessels um, early next year. So we're now at a depth of 2930 meters, which means we're getting pretty close to the seafloor. The first things that we're going to be doing as we come onto the seafloor are going to be dropping into a vent, into the location of a vent called the Matterhorn. And um, as you can gather from the name, the, um, the, the morphology of Matterhorn vent is, is quite pointed. Um, it's very distinctive. Um, it's a um, it's a relatively low temperature vent with um, well. I'm gonna I'm gonna save the description for our the next person who's gonna join you here because uh, I'm gonna be handing this off. Z. <laughs> <laughs> I will, in a, in a minute or two, be handing this off to um, Robert Zurenberg, a, 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 a geochemist who specializes in, in hydrothermal venting and the interactions of hydrothermal fluids um, in the subsurface with the, with the geology. Um, and since um, we're going to begin with water sampling at, at Matterhorn, um, I'm going to let Rob take over our, um, our um, actual coming onto the seafloor. Well, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Um, haven't seen this vent field since 2018. 
Um, so we've been over at the, the new vent field. Um, Yakma, um, now I can't pronounce it anymore. Uh, and this one is the Alka vent field. So this is the first one we discovered, like we said, in 2015. Dave described that. In fact, it was discovered on April 12th, 2015. Now, you may think I have a really good memory, but it just happens that that was my birthday. So it's a pretty easy date to remember. And it was a nice birthday present to uh, discover that um, because of weather complications and uh, port calls. We actually had a very, very short dive there. Um, and our prime goal was to, one, find the vents. You know, when we dove there, we had Dave's maps, but no one had seen this. So, um, and see if we could find an active vent. And, and the real uh, challenge was to get some water samples. We had a very short dive, but we managed to sample um, the hydrothermal fluids from one of the mounds. Um, if you're looking at this map, the the big mounds are all on the fault on the uh, left side of the screen. The closest one to you is the Z mound. Not really going to say it's named after me. We just put letters on them. But the two to the north are the C mound and the P mound. The P being the eastern mound. So that's the one where we actually got water samples. Um, and then um, we had to go back into port but um, another crew of biologists um, came back on the Embarry ship and then did some more dives and explored the vent field. And, um, it was, of course, it's always exciting to find a new vent field. I've been fortunate enough to, to be on, the, on two dives where um, the, we found the initial venting of um, um, the first observations of venting in two different fields. So i um, been privileged to be sort of in the right place at the right time to uh, see things that no one else has ever seen. So um, in my previous career as a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, we um, did a lot of work in the um, Juan de Fuca ridge system and um, in particular in the Escanaba Trough. and. Um, I happened to be in the album Submersible when uh, we first found the active vent. We'd been working there. Um, we knew we knew there was hydrothermal um, deposits there. We didn't know if they're active, so um, it, I was the uh, second person to see that vent. Of course, first person was the Alvin pilot because they're the ones who are doing all the the real work and all the science, just like our ROV pilots are the ones doing all the important work. Um, and the job of the scientists is just to sit here, babble on, and make unreasonable demands on the pilots. So um, this vent field, when we first discovered, looked quite different than anything we'd ever seen. One, you can see the size of those mounds, the, the three big ones that are over in the distance beyond uh, the map. Um, and they're really huge structures. But most um, vent deposits, high temperature vent deposits, are made of minerals like um, iron sulfide, pyrite and pyrotite, copper sulfide, calcopyrite, zinc sulfide, sphalerite. Um, and these mounds, even though the fluids coming out are at very high temperatures, have very little metal in them, most of them. Um, they're mostly calcium carbonate, and those who were listening to previous dives might re remember why black smoker fluids form when seawater circulates down on the order of two to three kilometers deep into the oceanic crust, which is made of volcanic rocks, gets heated up. The water and the rock react and form new minerals, and the water chem chemistry changes it becomes much more acidic. And when you have acidic water, it can leach elements out of the basalt, including things like iron and copper and zinc, and carry them in solution. And when those hot waters come to the sea floor and vent into cold water, then all of a sudden 
um, you, you drop the temperature and nothing is soluble and that's where all the minerals pr precipitate out. And the reason we call them black smokers is that the, the fluids coming out as they mix with seawater, you find, form particles of uh, very fine sulfide that look like black smoke coming out of a chimney. Well, when we dove on these, we had very hot vents. In fact, 289 degrees um, is the temperature of the venting at, at all of the major high temperature vents here. But the flows are coming out pretty clear and the deposits um, looked white. And when we got them back and sampled them, we found out that they're almost all calcium carbonate. The leading edge of chimneys is made of anhydrite, which is calcium sulfate and the hydrothermal fluid has no sulfate in it and so when calcium rich hot water mixes with uh, sulfate rich seawater the first mineral that forms is anhydrite so the leading edge of chimneys is made of anhydrite but as that um, chimney grows the interior is then isolated from mixing with seawater and then the minerals that are in equilibrium with the hot fluid form and so the inner chim chimney line of these is calcite, calcium carbonate, um, and the mounds and chimneys build up and fall down and more water comes and so these mounds are huge deposits of basically pretty much one mineral, calcium carbonate. Now we find little bits of copper iron and zinc sulfides in there, but compared to most places, um, there's very, very little metal. We think that there's no reason to think that the fluids that come out of the basalt basement don't have metals in them. But because we're in a deep basin near the continent, this deep basin is filled with sediment. And so the hot fluids come up and they interact with the sediment and that again changes their temperature, or I'm sorry, their chemistry. And one of the big changes is the pH of the fluids goes up, i.e. they become less acidic and you know that if you want to dissolve things like metals, you put them into acid. Well, if you make the fluids less acid, then those metals come out. So we think that somewhere underneath there, and we don't know exactly where, but maybe a kilometer down, there may be a very large deposit of copper and zinc sulfide in the subsurface. Um, of course, to prove that, we'd need to do some drilling. And it's actually my hope that the ocean drilling program will eventually uh, drill this site because I think it is one of the most important hydrothermal sites uh, we know of and um, is maybe the only example um, where we could easily drill uh, a subsurface kind of deposit like that. Now I said all the chimneys are made up of calcium carbonate and I thought that was true until um, we got back a couple of samples um, that were made mostly barite which is barium sulfate and it turns out that those barite samples, most of them came from uh, one little chimney, the Matterhorn chimney, which is where we're going to dive today. Also, that chimney, those barite samples, some of them have anomalous amounts of gold and silver in them. And in a geochemical um, association that's different from most of the uh, gold and silver deposits I, I'm aware of. They have almost no copper and zinc in them, so they're quite anomalous. Um, so what's a lot of gold and silver? Um, well, a sample we collected here in 2018 had uh, 4.3 grams of gold per ton and 550 grams of silver per ton. And that, if it was on land, would be a really good grade ore, all right? but. Do we have to worry about the mining companies coming screaming out here? I'm not so sure this is going to be a problem. If you figure out at today's metal prices how much a ton of that ore would be worth, it would be worth about $675. I don't know how much it cost us to get a single kilogram sample up on a dive, but it's um, a factor of maybe 10 or 100 or more times <laughs> the, the, that amount so um, yeah so you know mining companies mine to make a profit at least in um, capitalistic countries and if you can only sell a ton of ore for 
$675, and that doesn't include the, the cost of getting the metals out and purifying them. Um, you've got to get it to the surface for a lot less. And so um, I think this the deposit is very important because it tells us a lot about, potentially, if we can understand it, a lot about how ore deposits form and how to explore from them on land and what the environmental consequences of um, using them are. Um, but I am not too concerned about um, mining uh, at this deposit in the near future. Um, early on in the chat, there was a, a question about you know, could this be mined and who controls things? So uh, since we're still going down, we got a little bit and I'll just babble on about some things you may or may not care about. Um, who does own the mineral deposits in the sea? Well, we're in Mexican waters and most all countries have what they call an exclusive economic zone, usually 200 nautical miles from their coast. And so if someone were to want to mine this site, first they'd have to get permission from the Mexican government. Um, but when people started to discover things like manganese nodules in the open ocean, which are not within someone's terrain, you know, the question became, well, who does have the mineral rights? Who can control um, mining in the deep sea? And the UN, United Nations, took up this problem, got nations together, and over a long period of time, and it's still evolving, um, there were finally, uh, there was a UN convention called the Law of the Sea, um, which um, almost all nations have signed on to. Um, I think there are, do, 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 do. Um, I can't remember, 200 and, and 200 some odd nations have signed on to this. Um, the only large major industrial nation that has not is the United States. So most of the world has agreed to um, a protocol as to how mining was will, will be done if if it's done, um, but the Uni United States is not a signatory to this. To be a signatory, it needs approval from the Senate, and that has not happened. All right, so we're here to talk science. We're not here to talk politics. If you're interested in the law of C, um, I think it's really interesting to look this up. But um, because we're in the territorial waters of Mexico, these deposits, were they to be mined, and again, I can't see this ever being economic in my lifetime, um, would be under the control of the Mexican government. Okay, so we are gonna come down on this Matterhorn chimney. This, there's this one lone chimney, which is sitting out on the eastern side, I'm sorry, the western side of the vent field. Um, and for some reason, it has different uh, mineralogy than the others. Um, we, several of the uh, mounds have been sampled for, with rocks and, and all the high temperature ones have had fluid samples taken. Um, and in general, the, all of the mounds basically have about the same temperature and the same fluid chemistry. But because this was a small little chimney, and we didn't realize until we got better samples of it that it had different mineralogy. We've never sampled the fluids out of this chimney, so um, I'm very interested to know. I know this mound has a different composition in terms of its um, major mineral, which is barite instead of calcite, and I know it has very different trace elements, including the high gold, silver, and um, the element antimony is is very high in here so the the associations gold silver and antimony with almost no lead and zinc and copper um so we're really interested i'm really interested to to get a fluid sample to see if it's um similar or different to the rest of the field this is a low temperature chimney it's about um oh i'd say it's about eight meters wide at the base and it goes up about eight meters high um, and at the top of it it's covered with a 
a carapace of tube worms, or at least it was when we last saw it in 2018. Um, who knows how things have changed. And there's diffuse venting coming out of the, the tube worms. And the highest temperature we've measured there is only 87 degrees. So um, it's a hard place to get a good fluid sample because there's no active orifice. We can't get the, the uh, nozzles of the vents down into um, a, a, you know clear water. So what we'll do is try and find the highest temperature we can measure, get the bottles down and close to that, and we get a sample. It'll be mixed with seawater, but we can do the chemistry and extrapolate back and try and see how similar it looks to the other uh, vent fields. So that's our, our first target. Um, and um, we'll um, probably take a, a push core when we get there and then after we finish at that site we're going to drive north to another site which is a very vigorous high temperature vent um, and um, we'll talk more about that when we see there but that one was venting at 289 degrees um, when we last saw it in 2018 um, and that will be our second stop for um, trying to get vent fluid samples. Yes. So we're less than 300 meters off the bottom. So that is uh, the position from the Sebastian Nav in 2018. Yes. And then the map is adjusted you know, for the dial in on this year's navigation down at Yakima. Um, but there's the very real likelihood that there's distortions. You know, in the navigation the AUB data so that what's what's dialed in down you know, two hundred meters to the south is a dial mix so well but, uh, we'll mark it again, it? yeah so and what's gonna happen is if, if there's any kind of substantial offset I'm gonna run in the other room make a new geo tip with the ship for today and then slide that in. And then I, I've been waiting to put up the sub bottom line we're going to follow for the deep flow because I need to know what that shift is. Okay. Well, it's eight meters high, so we should be able to find pretty So you may have heard Dave Caress talking in the background there. I'll briefly um, summarize what he was saying. Of course, we've, if you've been watching dives, you know that navigation is a real challenge down here. We're 3,000 plus meters above where the ROV is, will be on the seafloor and you know we can send acoustic beacons and navigate to it and we have maps that we've made that are they're very accurate but how do you locate that map in space 
in real terms when it's below 3,000 meters of water. On the surface, we can use GPS, but we can locate the ship with GPS very well. But how do we register the map? And the, the answer is it's tough. And so when we get down there, we know our map is very precise, um, but where it's located in space is, is a little bit challenging. Uh, we've got this um, single vent sitting out here by itself, the Matterhorn, it sticks up, so it's a very prominent feature. So one of the first things we're gonna do is when we land the sub up on the top to begin our water sand, we will be sitting there. The acoustic navigation system, the USBL, which is ultra short baseline, um, acoustic navigation will be giving us positions and we'll integrate those and based on that we'll know how well located our map is in space and we'll be able to make adjustments if we have to to help us to guide the rest of the, the dive so um, that's one of the things that, that Dave Caress will be doing in the background he's the one who has made all these maps as you heard um, using his system and um, he's written all the software to, to process this kind of data um, and the map that you're looking at you see sort of the two um, the the the, yeah, the highlighted map now the background map that we just saw oh, before we get the highlighted colors is the map that existed from Dave's AUV surveys and so it's a lower resolution still a very high resolution map about meter scale and then the brighter colored areas are the areas that Dave said that they we've mapped with a system that was mounted on the bottom of Sebastian and that one has a centimeter scale resolution so we zoom in from shipboard uh, navigation with 30 meter spacing down to AUV navigation and mapping with one meter spacing down to these uh, this very detailed map of the vent field uh, or we only were able to map a part of the vent field at centimeter scale and mapping at that scale um, in a vent field is pretty unprecedented and then Dave's group um, Dave and the people who support him are just you know pushing the, the envelope and, and uh, as he said, we'll be coming back here and he will be coming back here in uh, early next year with a new and improved system that not only will allow us to map the flat parts of the seafloor in that resolution, but allow us to map up the sides of chimneys and um, the system will is um, hinged and articulated so as it comes up a slope, it will change its orientation, allow us to, to make really detailed maps. So. Now we're coming down, that's the, the Z edifice, um, and this is again about, I think that one is the tallest one here is about 27 meters tall. You can see um, how it uh, is surrounded by a, an apron of talus that have broken off. You can see that slope going around it, so as these mounds grow up and, and fall down, they uh, form these talus mounds. Um, which is how the big deposits build up. Again, though, we've got pretty cloudy water down here. Um, a lot of particulate matter raining down from the surface, which is good for the critters who want to eat that stuff, but it doesn't help our visibility much. But when we get close to the bottom, we'll have a, a good view. So Jenny is um, one of our colleagues at Imbari, and 
the Z mound is 25 meters tall. Thanks, Jenny. Nice to have you with us this morning. So the first thing we we'll want to do is temperature, of course. So and whenever you get comfortable and ready to fly up there, we can just go ahead and grab the high T probe. Okay. All right. As I said, this is the second of three legs. Um, the third leg will be starting. Um, on the 27th or 28th and it will be a biological leg and one of the people who's just joined the chat shauna goffredi uh, is a, a part of that team and shauna has written the, the definitive paper published so far on what the vet fauna here uh, consists of a really nice paper um, that if anyone wants more technical details about um, the known vent fauna at um, this site. You should check out Shauna's paper. The leg will be uh, led by co-chief scientist Victoria Orphan, um, who is a microbiologist and so it'll be a combination of microbiologists, some geochemistry and some um, biology um, and they will be working in close to the vents and, and bacterial mounds and um, we're going to be getting lots of really good images of the the creatures on on those dives and so um, i know everybody loves to see charismatic megafauna um, you're gonna get your chance to see that and because of um, the power of the cameras um, we can go beyond megafauna down to myofauna and still see really cool things. So um, I really encourage people to, to stay tuned for the upcoming biological dives. Um, and I always learn so much from listening to uh, Victoria or Shauna or Greg Rouse, who um, when they talk about these animals, they know lots and lots of cool stuff. So. Um, you should tune in for the upcoming biological dives. You're really going to love those. Our colleagues that are joining um, the, the leg coming up are right now sealed into a hotel room. Hey, here we are on the bottom. And we have a ton of clams. We must be very close to one of the vents because we're seeing very dense clam fields. Um, Where's the, oh, we're, we're, is that Jimmy right in front of us, isn't it? Uh, no, no. We're a little bit to the northwest. Uh, north. Which way are we yeah, headed? Let's see. Where we're is, is uh, okay, yeah. All right, so we're seeing uh, some hydrothermal uh, carbonate um, deposits and a ton of clam shells, a lot of dead clams, but I'm sure there are live ones in there. Um, so we're pretty much just on the fringe of the Matterhorn. We're going to get uh, the sub sort of settled down here um, and get things adjusted, and then we'll um, drive over to the Matterhorn, um, fly up, and, and uh, land on the top of it. So I'm not, I'm not seeing it in the scan, so I've got 
So once we get on top of the, the mound and try and take some vent fluids, first thing we're going to want to do is gra uh, measure some temperatures. And so you can see the arm right now, the, the starboard arm is grabbing the high temperature probe in, uh, in anticipation of moving up and starting to take some temperatures. So we're going to get the sub settled down here um, and get ready to drive over and, and find the Matterhorn, we'll see how close our maps are registered to the real world once we, we get on top of the Matterhorn. So now we're going to do a white balance to set the colors of the camera to as true as we can. So we just zoom in on the white patch and do an auto white balance on the cameras. So it's nice to hear from our biological um, colleagues who are sequestered in a hotel room. Um, and I know they're going to be out here sampling bacterial mats and um, we're going to try and image some of those and keep them in nice pristine shape for them when they get here. The reason they are sealed into hotel rooms, of course, is there is a pandemic going on and um, to protect people on the ship, which is a very close environment. Everyone who gets on the ship has to quarantine for um, about five days and they have to be tested and when they get on the ship we get tested repeatedly so um, there's always an emphasis on safety first here and um, I'm sure our biological uh, friends would love to get out and get some fresh air but they're making the sacrifice so they can come out here and do the kind of work that they love. So hang in there, guys. <laughs> the rat tail fish. Okay, we're heading south. Is that the matter room right there? Yeah, just kind of scan it back. Yeah. That looks about like the size of it. So we're moving to the south, and we've moved away from the the big clam community and we're, we're seeing the base of the Matterhorn in the distance. There's a chimney coming up. So um, we are coming in on the, uh, a little bit on the north side of the Matterhorn. So far from the view, things look very similar. There were always a big clod of clams around the vent and uh, a lot of bacterial mat around the Matterhorn. Here it comes into view, so the base of that chimney, a oh, good 10 meters across, something like that, and if I remember right, seven or eight meters high. You can see clumps of tube worms on there. Most, almost all of the tube worms are the Oasisia tube worms. Um, we may see one or two Riftia, but they're not very common here. You can see that there are some old little tiny flanges that have grown out from this chimney and a big cluster of two worms up at the top um, and as we get right to the top we should see some shimmering water coming out and that is going to be our our target to try and sample that shimmering water at the top um, from my memory um, this looks just almost identical to what I remember seeing it. I saw it 
first um, it was first seen in 2015 by um, the Ambari cruise geologist. Um, I saw it in 2017 on the Nautilus cruise run by Woods Hole that I happened to be lucky enough to be part of. Saw it in 2018, and here we are in 2021, and it really looks like it hasn't changed much at all. So the tube worms are, again, this Oasisia. I don't see any rifty at the moment. The ones that are in the most flow have got all this white flocculent um, mat on them of bacteria. Um, I think probably seeing some little palm worms in the... Uh, close in an event, but we'll have to zoom in to see that. So um, very typical of this event. Everything looks pretty much like I'd expect. So we're going to move, maneuver the sub around and try and get stable up here where we can make a temperature measurement. And then we're going to try and take uh, two water samples, one in what we call the major element, titanium major element samplers, and one in what we call our gas type samplers. So two different bottles. Um, and uh, our goal is to try and find the most focused and high temperature flow. Um, the, like I said, the highest temperature we've been able to measure down into the tube worms was something like 87 degrees. Um, so um, we're going to get a sample that is not particularly hot. Um, we're going to go for the hottest we can, but as you see, there's no like good chimney orifice or roaring black smoker up here. So um, sampling is uh, a little bit more of a challenge to get a, a really good sample, but um, anything we get will be better than what we have now because this has never been sampled before. So those of you who can see the chat, um, Shauna is uh, pointing out that some of the plumes, the ones in the hottest water, are much more orange color, and the ones around it are more red color. And based on um, some of the sampling and experiments we did in the 2017 cruise with Nautilus, um, we believe that um, that color change represents the amount of oxygen that the tube worms have in the plumes um, and that the oxygen the plume the tube worms have hemoglobin it's different from ours but similar and when it binds with oxygen it, it's a bright red and so we think the the more ones in the more oxygenated waters are brighter red and the um, the orange ones have a little less oxygen. And of course the tube worms need to be able to get both hydrogen sulfide coming out of the vents as well as oxygen because those plumes are sampling gases out of the fluids and they're um, taking those gases into the uh, interior of them where they have symbiotic bacteria and the bacteria are chemosynthetic and they're burning the H2S with the oxygen to make energy that then feeds the tube worms. So um, they need both the high temperature fluid, or at least the gases in the high temperature fluid, the H2S, and they need oxygen to be able to, to live. So um, the tube worms um, 
can only tolerate temperatures up to about 20 degrees or so. So even though there's hot water very near them, um, they're in uh, mixing zones where they can uh, be in a temperature scale or temperature uh, setting that allows them to uh, to survive. That looks like the best places where you want to. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're looking to try and get the temperature probe into the most focused flow we can there um, and uh, see if we can get a water sample. And I can see some gastropods on here. Um, once we get settled in and things are calm, we can zoom in the camera, but right now the emphasis is on letting the pilots do what they need to do. So we're not gonna touch or do anything until they get stable and then we'll start our, our measurements. Sampling hydrothermal vent fluids is always a real challenge. Um, they're never located in a convenient place. Although the next vent we're going to sample, I think, if it looks like it did when the last time we saw it, is one of the most convenient places I've ever seen to sample a vent. But it's it's always a challenge to to get stable with the sub and be able to do what you need to do because um, you're often at the top of some chimney <clears throat> where things are not very stable. So. We seem to be in a good place right now to be sampling, and that's the high temperature thermocouple probe. So we're gonna probe around, try and see what the highest temperature we can measure is, and then try and aim the bottles for that same fluid. Like I said, usually when we measure in here, we get temperatures like about 65 degrees C. The highest I remember seeing was 87 degrees C. Um, so we'll see. Um, the higher the temperature, the better the water sample um, that I can get. So um, more is always better. So we're in two degree seawater around this and the, the gradients in temperature, the amount of mixing, is, it's amazing how, how uh, quickly you go from very hot vent fluid to very cold water. The, the gradients in temperature are very strong, so um, just moving a centimeter or two, you can drop the temperature um, by 100 degrees or more. definitely see some little gastropods there um, grazing on the bacterial mat um, in the area where there uh, aren't any tube worms where it's a little hotter okay just uh, want to read you um, this is from five minutes ago sorry I didn't notice it before but Dave Clay 
commented, the areas on the Matterhorn with no two berms might have small flanges, although they may not be active, still worth trying to look up from below to be sure, as that might be your best bet for it. Is it for example, I think you're beyond that, but I guess those are dead. Okay, we're starting to move the probe in, getting up to 50 degrees, 80 degrees. Oh, the hottest we've seen, we're up to 140. Oh, I am excited now. Oh, wow. 180, still climbing. We've never seen these kind of temperatures. Um, I think we're going to get a very good fluid sample here if we can, if we can manage to get one. Um, we got up in the low 180s. Um, the temperature just bounces around because in these small orifices with a lot of mixing, um, it's very hard to find the, the highest temperature. We're sitting at about 150 now. I think maybe the 180 was more in that way, but we'll see. Yeah, so as we move out, things cool, as we move back in, now we're 130, 140, still climbing. Okay, about 147. Yeah, but just briefly. So we're sitting pretty stable at 135, 137. Yeah, just, just sort of move around as you will and then to see if you can find anything out of it. We'll, we'll take this if this is what we get. 140, climbing, 150. Uh, this is looking good, 160, Okay, so we're up to 177, 178. Let's just keep still here and let's see if it stabilizes and then we'll go for a water sample right uh, as close to <laughs> where the probe is again. So we're getting pretty stable temperature reading at 178. Okay, let's go ahead and Doing a yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to call it, uh, well, we're at 179. If we round up, 178.9. So we're going to call this 179 as the, the max T. Um, and now we're going to try and grab a bottle. Um, your choice as to which I think it might be better start with the gas type because. You know, they're quick, and then we've at least got one. So, if we're at 180 degrees, isn't that above the boiling point of seawater? Well, it turns out, of course, the boiling temperature is related to the pressure, and the pressure here is 370 times atmospheric. So, even though these waters are hot, um, we're well below the phase separation or the boiling boundary. Um, can't remember exactly at this depth, but the boiling point for seawater at this depth would be on the order of about 395 to 400 degrees. We're fairly deep, um, so we're quite a ways away from the boiling point. 
based on the fluid chemistry of the samples we took in 2015 from the top of the Z mound, which were at 389 degrees, um, the chemistry though suggested those fluids had to have been about 450 degrees in the subsurface because they had gone beyond the phase separation point and they had phase separated um, in what we call supercritical phase separation. Um, and uh, we might talk about what that involves a little later, but right now we got to focus on just trying to get a very nice um, fluid sample. So the salinity of these vents is higher than seawater. And this is how we know that they've they've phase separated, that they've lost some of the vapor phase, and we've got more of the brine phase. So the the total salinity is about 20% higher than the seawater, and of course the the fluid starts as normal seawater that circulates into the subsurface, but through reacting with the hot rocks and through a little bit of phase separation, the fluids coming out now are more saline than seawater, and more saline would make them denser, but because, of course they're so hot that they're buoyant still, so the density is a function of both the temperature and the salinity. So these little bottles that we're going to try and grab, um, these are called, these are what we refer to as the gas tight samplers. And the, these fluids have a lot of dissolved gases in them, mostly um, it's carbon dioxide, but also enough H2S to feed the, the two worms and the other vent fauna. Um, and so these bottles take a small amount of fluid and they seal it very, um, they can seal in the high pressures. And we will take them back to the lab. The, um, these will be analyzed by Marv Lilly at the University of Washington, who uh, designed and, and loaned us these bottles. And Marv's you know, one of our collaborators on shore who will be working up this data with us. And so we'll send these bottles back to him and he will extract the gases and see how much CO2, methane, um, and other hydrocarbon gases like propane and butane and other things are, and that will tell us a lot about the chemistry of these fluids. We'll also um, send them to our colleagues at NOAA, um, at PML Lab in, in NOAA, who will uh, take a subsample and run the amount of helium in the, in the samples and look at the helium isotopes, and that can tell us something about how, where the, what kind of rocks the, um, the fluid saw in um, the, the subsurface. So deep volcanic rocks have a different helium isotope ratio than continental rocks, and that can tell us a lot about the subsurface. Um, great shout out to my friend Karen and Davis. Nice to see you this morning. Thanks for, for joining us. Hope you're enjoying the show. Okay, so we, to fire the bottles, we have to use the uh, port arm. So now you see the port arm coming over to grab one of the gas type bottles. Okay, so now we, oops, almost have a grip on the, the bottle. 
need to get it registered with the the arm and of course grabbing a bottle like this is a three-dimensional problem mm -hmm. but unfortunately the pilots have a two-dimensional view just like you do so uh, a big challenge of doing this kind of precise work is, is trying to work in three dimensions when you only see in, in two it's, uh, the pilots are extremely skilled now we've got a lock on the bottle So I don't believe I mentioned it, but um, we've got Adam flying the sub right now, and Chris is running the manipulators. That's really cool. Since Sean and Victoria have been online there. Oh, of course, yes, of course. They wouldn't miss the world. You wanna, you wanna, while we're sitting here trying to say, you wanna say some things in Spanish? Sure. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to our co-chief, uh, Raquel, for a minute, and um, she's gonna talk to some folks as well. Hola, hola a todos desde el Falcor en, en, este, en este día que estamos haciendo estas mediciones súper interesantes de temperatura de una de las ventilas hidrotermales más famosas del capo de ventilas de Aucá y donde ya vimos que estaba pues mucho más caliente de lo que eh, eh, esperábamos y ahorita se están preparando los pilotos para la recolección de una muestra. Entonces, nada más para decirles que no se, no se pierdan esta parte de la, del, del buceo de hoy, que va a estar súper interesante. Eh, van a poder ver de cerca un montón de, de animales e, y la belleza de estas chimeneas es sin duda increíble. Entonces, manténganse en línea y eh, para todos aquellos que hablan español, eh, pueden hacer preguntas. Yo voy a estar por aquí. Y eh, un gusto saludarlos, ¿ok? La doctora Raquel Negrete desde el Falcor. Sigan disfrutando, los dejo con el doctor C. Bye. Okay. So sampling these vents is always a, a delicate operation. We're just trying to get everything set up so that the water bottles can be triggered uh, correctly. So um, you see in your view now the water bottle, that yellow thing is the hydraulic ram that 
pushes on the trigger of the, the button to fire the gas tights. We just need to get things adjusted so that uh, we can we can properly fire the bottle. So these things are always a, a bit of a challenge, and but we have really good pilots, and we're hoping they can work through these. It's low, it's lower today though. I mean, it's going to leave it right there and go all the way Yeah, I would, I would just leave it right there. Right there. Yeah. Right there. Although, before you do that, Chris, because look where your nozzle is, you're going to have to... Uh, I keep going in. Well, let's, let's see if we can get the nozzle in there and then we'll rotate it. Just because if you rotate it closer to the pocket, we'll depress it. Okay, so yeah, you can do Alright, so... That's next for now. I'll jump in for you. So unfortunately, it'll look like it's right there. That's all right. We won't get that one. It should be a problem. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we've got a delicate operation here to try and get uh, everything just set up just right.
so it's always a, a challenge to get the everything in the right orientation and we want to get that nozzle down in as close to where we took the temperature as we could um, and so um, pilots just move very slowly and, and deliberately and uh, we'll get there Can, can you go back toward the middle of the line? I think it's still sticking out this way too far. I see you've got your pointer there. The yeah. Yeah. If you show me, I can point on that screen. I mean, it doesn't matter the, the, the geometry is like this, so we have to go back this way to get down. Okay. So we're about to fire the, the bottle. We're going to push that ram in and Okay, release. Release? Yeah, and so the bottle is fired, um, and hopefully we have a sample. So when we pull it out, let's look at the bottle and see how hot it looks. Just see, see if there's shimmer in the bottle. And now we're going to try and look at the bottle and see if it uh, has heated up. Um, Okay, so I'm not seeing a lot of shimmer. What I'd like to do is take the second gas 
last time. Okay. Uh, I think yeah. you got to fire but I'm not sure the bottle's hot, so okay. I'd like to try and do the second gas tank here. Okay. You, you think like when it sucks it in the ends, like you, the actual chamber should be shipping? Yeah. Okay. Um, not so much these as the majors, but because there's less water and a lot more thermal mass, but right. uh, it's I'll have one. Yeah. I'll have another chance to get um, gas tank at the other end. So I'd rather try and burn two here. Okay, um, so hopefully we've got a, a sample, um, but um, getting the gases on this vent is really important. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, ask the pilots to take a second uh, gas tight sample here, um, and then. Uh, We'll take a major element sample here, um, then we'll head off to another vent where we'll just take a major element sample and hopefully on leg three we'll be able to do a gas tight in that vent. But um, it's a high priority to try and get the chemistry of this vent and I want to maximize our chances by um, using two samplers here. So that's our strategy right now. The sampling bottom bottles are custom made, and custom engineered out of titanium. They're pretty pricey. So once we take them, we like to tie them down with the bungees to keep them from falling out of the sub. It's something we, we don't wish to lose in the seafloor. So the pilots are now just going to secure this bottle back um, into its uh, holster. And then we're going to untether the other bottle and, and try a second gas tight sample at this vent. So there's, there's one down. Right, I'll say it. Yeah, it didn't wear. Yeah. 
Don't do Good call, but I appreciate you catching that up again. Yeah. One cast tech, one major. Um, I decided to do both cast sites here. I wasn't sure the first one really got into that, so this is my high priority, so I'm going to burn them both here. Okay. And then hopefully, in the next leg, we can do a cast time together. Okay. Just make sure. Yeah. Um, Clay thinks um, it was. He was not in the highest hit place. I could tell him that was a little off to the side. And he suggests that you do both majors here, too. Well, we'll see. But when I get the majors, then I can see whether it's bending out the tube or not. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I'll, I, just make, I can make that call. So, yeah. But this I'm going to burn a boat because I can't tell. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
we're, we're not in, we need to be further back in toward the chimney. But we're, if the orifice is here, we're out here. We need to go back like that. So we're going to reset ourselves just a little bit and try and get a better geometry to approach this. Yeah, okay, I'm liking that better. If we can get down there. If no well, if we can get down back there. How about trying to get back in here and go down there? Okay, so back like this? Yeah. I think we want to be in as far to the chimney as you can and then go in. Yeah, and that's mostly still seawater. If you can if you can get in there and just go down a little bit, we'll be better off. Yeah, I mean the mix ingredients are incredible here. It's just really hard to. 
I don't think we're in now. I think we want to, when we were back here, that was pretty close. I think. And to me, it looks like this is the most vigorous flow right there. right there, right? Okay, fire. That you can release. Yeah, as soon as it goes in, it fires. So, yeah, it's done. So, yes.
Okay, so we're stowing the second gas type sampler, and now we're going to try and take a, a major element sampler. Both of the bottles really do similar things, but one of them was designed preferentially to keep high pressure so the gases don't come out. But that the seals allow us to do that um, are not as clean, and so we don't get as good trace element data from those water samples as from the major bottles. And so the major bottles can leak a little gas on the way up, but they take a sample that allows us to do much better trace element chemistry. That's why we use the, the two different bottles. Tube worms um, are known to grow very quickly. Most of the studies have been done on how quickly they grow, have been done on the big riftia tube worms, but tube worms can grow as fast as bamboo if they're in the in a really nice situation. So I think the blue bottle, we'll put the bent bottle, is going to be the best one yep. for the okay. geometry. Sure. Um, so we don't know how old these tube worms are, but they're on the order of years to tens of years. Um, when we get to cold seed fauna, which have similar looking but slightly different tube worms, some of those can we think can live for hundreds of years. Um, but uh, these tube worms grow very fast and um, replace themselves quite readily. One of the ways that um, tube worm growth was measured is a little clever experiment where um, I think it was Chuck Fisher went down with um, a little. Um, a little bell, uh, kind of like a, uh, a clothes dryer, I mean a hair dryer, and he stained tube worms with red color um, and then came back a year later and they had grown and there was white tubes and then he stained them with blue color and came back a year later and collected them and then had uh, three years worth of growth to, to look at the growth rate. It's a clever little experiment. So now we're looking at what we call the major element bottles, again made out of titanium, basically a big titanium syringe. Um, and these collect a bigger volume of water and they also um, give us a cleaner sample to, to do chemical analysis on. And so the snorkels on these have a map that we can look at and, and here we'll actually know whether we're in or not with sea flow coming out right now. So we'll have a much better idea whether we're in or not at those. Yeah. Well, there's really not much of an orifice in many areas. I mean, it's just kind of, I think, I, I think he did too. <laughs> the only problem, of course, is. Was actually with uh, Chuck Fisher. That was done with the brine pool. I heard you about the dome. Yeah. Brine pool. The Gulf of Mexico. That was like 25 years ago. Yeah, Chuck's been around as long as I have been doing this stuff. We made that uh, dye device at Harbor Branch. I'm sorry? We, we made the, the, the dye device at Harbor Branch.
So if you that little hole right there next to the this little hole right next to where the snorkel goes, yeah. that's where it should be venting from. Yeah. Oh, it has. It tripped. Yeah. Yeah, no, it tripped. I didn't see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to do the second major here and we'll just. Okay, we're uh, gonna stow this water bottle. Um, it um, fired prematurely, um, and uh, we're gonna have to come back and try and do the, the sampling here another time. So uh, once we get this bottle stowed, we're gonna go down to the base of this um, vent, take a push core for our colleague, Ron Spells, who was the co-chief on Lake One, and then we're gonna move on and take a quick look at um, Diane's vent, um, and we'll take um, a rock and a, and a, a push core sample there. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Um, you know, Diane's vent is a very interesting feature, um, very vigorous vent when last seen. Um, and after we get a quick push core at the base of this, that's where we'll be heading. So the trigger broke off? The, the Ram pusher. Ram yeah, pusher. All right, so so you're done. You can't do yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah.
Okay. I'm going to grab something to eat real fast unless you need me here.
we've got our bottle safely stowed now and we're gonna just uh, slide down to the bottom of this uh, vent and pick up a, a little piece um, that came from the arm and then we'll take a push core here and once that's done we're gonna head north about a hundred and fifteen meters to Diane's vent Okay, now you've seen the, the top of the Matterhorn chimney with the two worms on it and the distance you see uh, to the bottom. There's a bunch of clamshells down just on the, uh, beyond the chimney there. Um, we're going to slide down here and uh, recover uh, a piece of our trigger and then we're going to take a push score. see both red and white anemones on the chimney um, the oasisia tube worms the little blue things are scale worms those are uh, uh, Vic, um, and now we see some white bacterial mat coating the chimney and we're gonna stop here and um, Grab that trigger. So just beyond the, the trigger we're trying to grab, you can see one of the little purple scale worms. That um, species is Orphani, it's named after, um, it's our co-chief on the next leg is Victoria Orphan, and she was named after that scale worm. Oh, wait a minute, that's not right. That scale worm was named after Victoria Orphan.
Okay, now that we've stowed that, we're going to set down on the bottom here, um, just a little bit away from the vent and take a quick push core, and then we'll be heading north 115 meters to Diane's vent. So we just go somewhere over in, in here. Uh, well, let's see, that's where we are? Yeah, so be over in here. Just for a good place to set down and get a set of a push core but not on a bacterial map. Do we somewhat to the left side? Yeah, just, yeah. Just, just have that view and come down and once we don't see bacterial map anymore, yeah. we'll just sit down there. It, and where it's soft off the core, there's okay. a lot of uh, rubble at the bottom, so outside the rubble. Yeah, that's looking good. As we come up there, then I'll switch in. And so, um, what will happen is the sound as it comes in.
Okay, so the uh, the rack you see coming out has push cords in it, and we'll take the the bungee cord holding them in off of one. We'll do a quick push core in the sediment here, and then we'll be moving north to the other vent. So this will be push core one, take the core two to B. Yes. All right, so we're about to take push core one in core tube B, and we're taking it about four meters west of the base of the Matterhorn chimney. So we've got a full insertion, 30 centimeters into the sediment. Now we have a nice sediment sample that will go to Ron Speltz and his colleagues, who was co-chief on Mike One, and they will do some geochemistry on this core.
Okay, so we're ready to just do a transit at 115 meters to the north. I'll show you the target. It's very obvious when we get there. It's, it's not. Uh, I mean, 115 meters. 115 meters, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're about to pick up and uh, drive north about 115 meters to Diane's vent, which was a very vigorous um, 289 degree um, vent when last seen in 2018. So we're currently on the west side of the, the Matterhorn, looking east. You see a ring of dead clam shells around it, and over on the southeast side, um, there were some nice bacterial mats here in 2018, and um, we haven't seen that side yet, but we presume they're still there. But we will be checking that out on future dives with the uh, when the biological team is aboard on leg three. Yeah, can you hear me on third comms or not? Brian and Charlie. Out the bridge, radio check. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? So we're just going to recover a, a little piece of the ROV that decided that it liked it here and wanted to stay at this vent. It's a nice place, but it's going to have to come home with us. fish who wants to see just what are we doing here.
So we're stowing this in the spare parts compartment. Thank you. 
So you can see some clam tracks there, some very artistic clams. Um, I can't quite read what they wrote, but I'm sure it was something interesting. And here you see a, a clam right at the end of its track. Um, these clams move by, they stick out their foot and, and push forward. And the reason they plow around for the sediment is they're looking for a nice place where they can get some hydrogen sulfide, probably from bacterial sulfate reduction that feeds the symbionts inside of them. Um, so away from the vents where there's not a lot of hydrothermal hydrogen sulfide, the, the clams tend to burrow around until they find a nice place to, to hide. And then all the places with the little white specks, if we got up close to those, you'd see those are little pinky siphons from clams that are buried and are sitting there happily eating where they are. So now we're transiting north, heading for Diane's Vent. We're on a sediment covered bottom. We're going to go over a little low mound that um, is a, a uh, non active hydrothermal area. And then we'll come into Diane's Vent, which is, which when last seen was a very vigorous um, hydrothermal vent of 289 degrees. The urchin there you see the with the purple plumes, he's actually attached to the top of a clam. So some of these clams have urchins that are attached to them as the clams burrow around. Um, the urchins go along for the ride and presumably benefit by filter feeding some of the sediment that's kicked up by the, the clams as they move. A whole bunch of zoarsid um, fish on the bottom there, the long skinny eel-like looking fish. And again, you see a few dead clamshells at the surface, but a lot of those little white things sticking up are siphons from live clams that are buried um, underneath. So they need to have their foot down as deep as they can to try and get hydrogen sulfide, but they need to be able to get their um, snorkels up to bring in um, water from the bottom that contains oxygen. So they need to live at this interface between where they can get reduced species, hydrogen sulfide, and oxidized seawater to feed their symbiont so that they can live. Uh, we're getting near this old, um, well, it was an, ex uh, an extinct hydrothermal mound, a very low one. And you see it again as we approach the hydrothermal features, we get more and more clams, a lot of dead clam shells in front of us. As we get closer to this mound, it's not quite dead. It actually uh, is still somewhat active, um, which you can tell from the bacterial mats. Um, so the biology is telling us something about the fluid flow. So here's this mound that um, is when last seen didn't have any high temperature venting but does have um, enough fluid flow to make some bacterial mats coating the the rubble of the mound um, i don't remember seeing two worms on this little mound i don't think there are any but we'll see Nothing high sticking up on 
time to listen to Steve Ray Bennett, but, but, but Diane Sanders is yeah. on your side. It's oh, scary. Scary. Oh, scary. Um, yeah. The only thing I was going to say is that I Okay, so now we're coming up to the top of this. You see um, lots and lots of clam siphons sticking out, some yellow and white bacteria mat, and then you see some bluish color there without being closer to it. Um, um, not quite. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I know that there was a dense um, colonies of blue octocoral um, in this area, and I suspect that's what the, the bluish color is probably from those octocoral. And it looks like there is a little bit of uh, shimmering water coming out of here, but fairly low temperature venting at the top of this older mound. We'll probably come back here on Lake 3 and maybe sample some of these rocks, but right now we're heading north to Diane's vent. So now that we've moved away from that little um, cold seep mound, again, you see how the, the density of clams has dropped off, and now we just see a few older clam shells, and uh, there are still live clams in the sediment, but not nearly as dense as when we're near the hydrothermal areas.
Well, hello again. Uh, this is Chief Scientist David Caress, um, and we are coming in on Diane's vent. And uh, you can see that the vent is um, flowing quite copiously. You can see the shimmering water there. And on the left, uh, you see a monument. Um, that monument uh, is a memorial plaque and we're maneuvering the ROV so that we can um, get some good imagery of this vent, Diane's vent, and the memorial plaque that is next to it, um, which as you can see um, says Diane Kirsten Poles Adams. Uh, this, this memorial was placed here in 2017 um, using ROV Hercules, operated from exploration vessel Nautilus, which is operated by uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, that 2017 expedition um, was um, involved many scientists from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and that science team placed this memorial, this plaque here, to honor the memory of Diane Adams, uh, a marine biologist who studied and worked at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and then became a professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Diane was a well-known and highly respected marine biologist and was dearly loved by her family, her friends, and the colleagues that she worked closely with. Um, those same colleagues that, that place this memorial here. Um, I wanted to um, let you know what we're looking at um, as we sit down and, and um, settle in on the video. Uh, we're going to take a, a minute, uh, a few minutes to get some good images, and we're going to take a minute um, turning the mic off uh, for a moment of science and, and silence in, um, in honor and memory of Diane Adams. Please bear with us. Um, So you can see the vent is um, still very active. You can see the shimmering water. And the memorial. Okay, we will begin our, our minute of silence now.
Okay, well, thank you. Um, again, this um, memorial is in memory of uh, a well-known, well-respected, and well-loved marine biologist, uh, Diane Adams. And I'm going to turn you back over to Dr. Z, who's going to direct um, a push core uh, a little bit away from this vent, and then we're going to proceed on north to start our heat flow transect. temperature vent, right? Yeah. And the other one, would be, you would have considered it cool. Well, it's well but it is to be yeah. cold. <laughs> right. Uh, so this push core is also for Ron? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got one from there. there. It's a different so, so. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, hopefully uh, in the next leg we will come back and try and uh, sample this vent for water if we have time and um, there's a nice bacterial mat on the side of this vent that uh, I'm pretty sure that our uh, microbiologists are going to want to do some work at that mat. So we're going to fly. So um, we're going to just lateral down and land on the uh, side of the mound here where there's clear sediment, clean sediment that we can push for. We'll take a push quick push core and after that then we are going to start um, the heat flow part of this dive. So okay. So previously we've measured temperatures of uh, 289 degrees here and based on the size of that orifice and um, I, if I remember correct I think Adam Sewell who was out here with the Nautilus group who um, placed this memorial I was fortunate enough to be a part of that. Um, I think he measured flow velocities out of there that allow us to estimate that that one vent would be um, putting out the equivalent energy of um, about a three to five megawatt geothermal well, which is sort of this average um, temperature of geothermal wells um, in Iceland. I do a lot of uh, my work in Iceland on geothermal energy and the chemistry of those fluids, and um, which have a lot of similarities to the black smoker fluids were, were um, Sample, trying to sample in these vents, and so uh, if you had about uh, 20 of those vents and could contain the water, you could have a 100 megawatt power plant, which uh, produces uh, enough energy for a city of about 50,000 or so, if I remember my numbers correctly. So, an awful lot of energy coming out of the seafloor just there. People are commenting about it's odd that there are no two burns here, and that's exactly what we thought when we first found this. Um, my interpretation of this, you can see some old fallen chimneys here on the edge of it. Um, because there's just this one vent and it's coming out so rapidly, um, there's no place for tube worms to live. They have to be in a place where they get high, or hydrothermal fluid and oxygen, but that hydrothermal fluid is so hot Right yes, this would be good. Um, so we're going to sit down here and take a push core. There's no place on that chimney where you can be in cool enough water for a tube worm to live, 
but um, and not be cooked by the fluid. And if you're too far away, then it's too cold and you have no hydrogen sulfide. So there's a nice tunicate there. I'm sorry, um, tenophore in front of us um, with our lights refracting off of its cilia. So we're just going to sit down here, take a quick push core, um, and then we're going to move off to the um, heat flow part of this dive. So. So I believe at one time there was a much taller chimney here. The you know typical chimneys we see on the top of these have orifices that are about oh, five to ten centimeters in diameter, and that chimney base has a big orifice about thirty centimeters. And what I believe happened is the chimney started to grow up. It got high enough that it collapsed. And because it had formed a nice chimney wall that was so big around, um, the chimney can't grow unless it can get a mixture of cold seawater, which has sulfate, and hot hydrothermal fluid that has um, calcium in it. And chimneys grow by in the mixing zone when hot seawater mixes, uh, hot hydrothermal fluid with calcium mixes with cold seawater with sulfate. And unless you get that proper mix, you can't saturate with calcium sulfate and hydride, so the chimney can't grow. So the leading edge of chimneys is growing where you, in this mixing zone between hot water and seawater, it forms anhydride. As the chimney grows up, the hot fluid um, comes into contact with the interior of the chimney, and that's when the calcite starts to precipitate. And so we have sampled the the chimney fragments from that vent and they are indeed um, mostly coarse grain calcite and I said that these vents typically have very low metals um, which is true but this one the highest copper and, and lead values we saw were from this sample but um, compared to black smokers they were still pretty low values all right so now we've collected a core for our colleague Ron Speltz and we are going now to trans to uh, transit to the north and a little bit to the west um, when we were here in 2018 we did a, a long heat flow transect similar to what we've been doing over at the, the uh, other vent field and we, we ran that vent field, that, that transect right to the edge of this vent field. We were right on the western margin of the of the active venting area. And now we're going to extend that to see how the heat flow changes as we move to the west. Um, we know that coming in from the east side to the vent field, uh, there's a fault that controls where the big high temperature mounds are, and the heat flow spikes up just as we hit that that um, that boundary with where the fluid flow is coming out. And now what we want to do is um, see how the heat flow falls off on the other side of the vent field. And so if the vent field is symmetrical, we'll see a very sharp drop off as we get out of the field. but. Since there's a big fault on one side, we think that maybe we'll see a much uh, more gradual decrease. And looking at the details and of how that heat flow varies with space allows us to do some thermal modeling and try and understand what the fluid flow is. So, so that's the purpose of the, um, the heat flow work that we're about to do. So I'm going to turn over the dive to our co-chief. Uh, Raquel, uh, are you ready? So um, our co-chief and head of the heat flow team is going to take over here and uh, explain just what we're up to next. So thank you all, and we'll see you on another dive. Thanks. Thank you, Zeke. Uh, 
How far is it there? So it didn't trace it? Mm -hmm. So John is going to be putting up uh, uh, four points that will make the lines that are the sub-bottom profile that we're going to follow. Uh, the positions of those points have been shifted uh, to match the ROV navigation. So we're going to want to be right along those lines. Never mind that the bathymetry is shifted by about 15 meters underneath you. Okay. So when Don comes in, we'll get those in in whatever color you want, and that'll be what we'll guide the uh, heat flow. And then, uh, so what you're going to see when those lines go up. And, and I think I think that the positions of the line are going to be accurate. I, I cross-checked where the Matterhorn was in, in a couple of ways. So there's the line we followed previously. And of course, that ends in the line that goes off this way. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that second line is about 30 meters north. Mm -hmm. And so both of those are going to show up. And the overlap is going to show up. And the point, the waypoint we have there should be roughly where we left off on the, the profile. And so your choice is going to be you could just go parallel to the, the other sub bottom profile and just continue on. You could jump up. You could go, go back a little east and then go forward. I think 
right, decisions but, here are made in, in no, terms of being time limited. But. Right, but um, I would want to stay as close as we can to the body, so bottom profile line. Yeah, that, that is my thinking as well, that yeah. we would just jump up and then start proceeding out that line. Right, yeah, definitely. Okay, so it's not going to be marked? And, uh, I mean, it's will we be going, able to John see? John is going to put that in, or, uh, okay. or okay. Okay. Yeah, he's. Okay. I did the shift and gave him the points, and now he's translating. Uh, he has to bring it in here on a on a stick and okay. get it into the uh, the secure network of the, uh, the ROV. Okay. Great. So the only question is where where uh, Florian and Raquel want to take the first step. I don't know if it is a way. West. Yes, please. But yeah, but on, on the on the sub bottom profile line, right? On the, the upper sub bottom profile. Line. Well, yeah. Okay, so. Let's use the pointer. So we had one AUV mission that did its launch there. We had another one that did one up there. It was about a 30 meter awesome. We did a previous profile on two there. And what Rick Cowan and Florian want to do is go on this line now, but go 100 meters from this, from, from this uh, point right there. That's okay. 100 meters. Okay. Is that correct? It's going on as a step six. Wow. Okay. Uh, 
So, so that's what you want. You don't want, you don't want to take the first measurement there and check down not to that, right? Yes. I like it from roughly this area right here. got a nice email from uh, her colleagues. Okay, that's good. They really appreciate it. So they're finding things happening. Good. I'm not sure about it. You know, they're colleagues. Chewing gum, everyone? I'll just pass mine. Thank you. These are the best. It will it will take it will take a long time to for the flavor to wear off.
far as the next one going to be? Or we don't know yet? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a pro probably 100 meters, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm a little bit later. I'll set up, I'll set up for it now. That way I can get the vessel moving that way. Okay. That's fine.
Suprabhan. The Pravan, the Pro, Pravsan. Okay. You're ready to start. Well, good afternoon from uh, Falkor again. This is Raquel. Thank you for your patience, Sky. We were just transiting from this. Diane went to our fir the first location for our first measurement here. So um, yeah, we're still here. And so thank you for joining us. I see the usual people and some new people as well. So welcome to this transmission. And um, well, what's going on here, I'll be explaining in a little bit of the background of um, what we're trying to accomplish here today. So the story goes that we went, to, we came here in 2018 and did some heat flow transects. From this point, um, I, we did actually three transects and from this point where we are at, to the, to the east, one of them. And so th to the east of this particular position where we are, there's some traces of a big fault that's um, underneath. And uh, we just actually published the paper with that data. And uh, we were trying to show the, the, program, the interaction between um, the beetle faults, big faults in the, the, um, the way the hydrothermal systems um, behave. So now that we're here, we have the opportunity to finish that transect because all three transects that we did were from the center of the vent field to the east. And so we have no data to the west of the fault. So it will be very nice to see what we find on the other side. So that's why we're here. And so we will try to accomplish at least one complete profile that will be a continuation of the one that we did on 2018. So welcome back. And as you can see, we already inserted a probe. All thermistors are in, so that's good news. And uh, we think this is going to be a hot spot. And so in a few minutes, we will see how high those, those thermistors go, OK? Um, so don't be shy if you have any questions, especially the people that have been around with us for the last few days. They know the drill, so I don't want to be too redundant. But uh, see if you have questions or comments or uh, non-related questions to the science that you could ask, that's, that's fine as well. OK, so welcome everybody.
So just for you to know, we, we're not having any, uh, experiencing any uh, technical difficulties with the light. Uh, what happens is that the pilots are just um, showing the artists here on board um, the different lights that they can uh, they can um, point to it towards a particular place. So this has to do with Ale de la Puente, which is our resident artist for this expedition. And so she's been observing all the time. She's the nicest person in the world. And uh, well, she tried yesterday to actually draw a line. Well, of course she wasn't her, it was J. Road, and um, and I think she wanna try something different today. I'll ask her, and I'll let you know. Pero si hacemos una especie de 100 metros, ¿no? Pues es una hora si pudo volver a la de la que más o menos todo hasta la calle. Entonces, pues, si ahorita en 100 metros, un cambio mucho, nos vamos a 200 metros de la calle. Ahora sí, pues, no tenemos tiempo, ¿no? Entonces hay que aprovechar esto de aquí para experimentos, ¿no? Porque no hay tiempo. ¿Tú crees que esto es esperando que de regreso, pues en la cercanía de la calle hubiera otra vez algún tipo de vivo? No sé, se ve muy grande la falla, pero como dice Juan, yo también estoy de acuerdo con él, que las fallas grandes están bien. Sí, ¿verdad? 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 Sí, no, porque la anterior era completa. Sí, hay que ahorrar más este tema.
si es blanco o no es de su parte de la zona, se compró, se ganó la cerveza. Sí, es muy bien. Sí, es muy Okay, just to answer James' uh, uh, question of uh, what the range of values that we've measured so far, well, this outcap Benfield is very special because we, uh, in the middle of the Benfield, um, we went as high as 90 degrees, uh, 90 watts, sorry, per, uh, per square meter, and then a beautiful decay of 70, then 30, then uh, um, it, it, I think it, it dropped uh, around 15 or not, and then nine. And um, you know, as we were going away from the band field, um, the heat flow was decaying pretty much uh, to the, uh, in a ratio that was the inverse of the distance from the band field. So where we started today, we were close to a point that was, oh, I'll just make a pause because this is J-Rod doing some beautiful uh, design of a line for Ale and her work. Yeah, good job, J-Rod, that was a ni nice line. <laughs> So I was, as I was saying, the last point that we did here in, in, in close to here, like 30 meters away, was 3.8. So it's clearly like uh, that this side of the bend field, um, you know, the west side of the fault is not going to be as nearly as hot as we saw on the other side. So we are guessing, and we're now we're going to move another 100 meters following the, the line to the west. And we are thinking that we're gonna start seeing um, values going below that three value that we saw. So there's some action for this, um, the Star Wars lovers. Just give me a second.
So I think we're going to go for a hundred meters of rain to the next one. It's going to be 100 meters. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, so answering uh, Dave's question on why are we doing heat flow and what's, what we expect to learn from uh, taking heat flow measurements and if it's related to plate tectonics or, or what. It's a very important question and I really um, I appreciate uh, that you uh, throw it out on the table. So I tried my best to explain um, to try and do an easy explanation. So this is these are these uh, hydrothermal vent fields are should be feeding from a source, right? So that source should be hot enough to uh, transfer all that amount of heat and you know warm the water and then you'll have not only heat transfer but also fluid fluid transfer along the systems so one of the reasons that we're trying to do, one of the reasons or the objectives that we are pursuing here rather is well if we understand how the heat flow decays and we do it thoroughly following the sub-bottom profiles, which is a shallow seismic um, image of the subsurface, then we can relate where we are looking at higher temperatures and if it's related to a structure on the subsurface. So that allows us to go further and then modeling whatever we think is going on down there. In other, in other words and I would like I always like to call it understanding the plumbing the plumbing system that is transferring all the heat and the fluids that actually create these vent fields so the cool part is that in another way you can actually um, say more things about um, the processes that are uh, involved in this, uh, for, in the formation of these hydrothermal vent fields. So in 2018, we tried to focus our attention on faults where conducts or, you know, like tubes where all this heat could move easily than just through the sediments. And uh, so we're still learning and Whatever we learn here and in this particular location will help understand other bent fields in other systems and there's where we can compare the tectonics, Why, right? So remember the gulf is a, wrong, a young rift, so that means that we are having 
spreading of the crust here and the formation of new oceanic crust. So um, it, there's other band fields in other tectonic settings. So at one point we will be able to compare. I hope that wasn't not too long of an answer and uh, you could follow me. If you didn't, let me know. Are you on the bottom? Okay. You're welcome, Dave. Okay, insert rope, please.
know what to think about these guys. Oh, 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 oh. It's you. You know what your pilot so well. I know. I... The bag opening is not good, but... Um... You're very welcome. These sour ones, huh? I like it much better than the other ones. Combination of bread, I mean, very better than sour patch and good Perfectly. You can make a bigger opening of that bag if you want. Hola, buenas tardes. Iba a preguntarme justamente eso, que si en un sábado íbamos a tener este audiencia hispanoparlante. Entonces, ¿por qué me haces hablar en inglés, Dave? Si hablas español. Este, contestando a tu pregunta, eh, pues yo soy investigadora en el CICES, eh, que está en Ensenada, México. Y eh, pues normalmente tenemos seminarios o conferencias o webinars. Entonces, eh, pues la verdad es que cuando estés por Ensenada, date una vuelta al CICES o visita la página y ahorita todos los seminarios son eh, en línea, entonces puedes um, accesar a ellos sin ningún problema. ¿Ok? Thank you. 
espaciar por esos pequeños este, seres que quién sabe qué son. El, ¿Las como anémonas? Sí, es que son. O sea, anémonas, según sí, yo. Sí, hay unas chiquititas. Uh -huh. Sí, sí, sí. Unos pueden ser, esas son anémonas y hay otras que son como sifones. Déjame ver. Regresamos al primer. Es que ese es el máximo zoom. Sí, está en, es como si fueran, o sea, es otra, otra o sea, tipo de ser o, o es bebé no. y grande. Ajá, ajá. Sí. Yo creo que sí. Pues son un montón, no se habíamos visto. Sí. A veces se pierden cuando hay muchos bichos más grandes, pero sí hay de ese tamaño, ¿eh? Más o menos. Qué paisaje. Sí. Okay, so there's a couple of questions there. One from Dave. I don't think we are perturbing the biology uh, with the heat pulse because it's, it's a tiny heat pulse that is so close to the thermistors that it's, uh, it's a, a really local effect. And then somebody that was asking if the mud is rich in carbonates. Well, not necessarily as the, the material with, with um, well, the material that the chimneys are made of, but certainly at this depth, it should should have a fair amount of carbonates. So our next move is going to be 100, uh, 200 meters from here. 200. Yes, but yeah. can we move forward? Yeah, so. Okay, guys, say goodbye to your cucumber friend there. And um, we're retrieving the poke and then we're moving on 200 meters for the next station.
Yes, that is the new church. With large and shifting. Yes, that should be it. Well, I just go to the other one. Did you bring in the um, world files from the other ones? Did I? Um, in, in that directory, there, the, um, where, where you have brought in the 
those gaps to include the TFW files previously? We just brought over the TIF. Uh, I never checked to see whether any of that's used. Just go back to the other one. I'm sorry. So background was higher on the west side, correct? Yes. yes. Well. What was that? Before the well, well, you know, the furthest measurements were around this, this valley. Okay. So.
Are you in the bottom? Yes, you're on the bottom. So, guys, what do you think about Ruggiero's ability to draw lines? He's getting better and better, huh? We hope the artist is happy. So we're here to make our third measurement for the day. As you can see, as we go away from the bend fields, um, okay. some of the... So the probe is going in, and if you look at the screen on your left hand side, you will see how this the insert the probe is inserted. Yeah, it's something. Oh. Put it back down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. something. Okay. So pulling out then? Yes, please. But just, but just let's move a little bit. It, it's weird because where you poke, it seemed fine. That's not your line? Uh, I just used that anchor to move the ROV a little bit. Uh, okay. Instead of actually having to thrust around and mess up the this. Okay. My line now has a second line. <laughs> Something weird with T1. Yeah? Okay. okay. All right. Let's try and get the full in, please. All right. Come on in. Oh, 
Thank you. Sweet. I think they're all in. for a long time without getting my feet cold, so it's just like an old lady. <laughs> so if I'm not going to be sitting for a couple of hours or so, then I... Other, yeah, otherwise I'll be... <laughs>
no estuvo. Claro. No, son los primeros cinco días y luego ya. ¿Cuál es la dirección de la, de la galería de mi? Es la que va a abrir de la memoria del tal y recuerdo. 10.23 blogger de Sebastián, es 10.23. 10.23 blogger de ¿Qué tal? Probado, please. Probado, please.
So well, we have to expand the world. Should have the S key there, that bottom one. Yeah. Because you see the computer right now. Sometimes that happens. I definitely had a problem before. Oh, they are. We know we're not going to fall off. Well, they, we can see on the other display over there where, where the fault is. So the, the key thing is, you guys want to tell us how far away we are from that, that fault? I can draw it. We can draw it. Yeah, let's just um, let's get a, a distance to the scarf. Scarf here. No, the big, the bigger scarf out in front. It's about 600 meters out. I think we're going to make it. Yeah. Think so? Yeah. Yeah. When you asked me earlier, I was assuming 50 meter boots, not 200 meter boots. Well, that part of it was, you know, can we? Can they make that distance, you know, that moves uh, with the ship and everything? And, you know, you know, I think today is such good conditions that it's possible. How far away we are from the pole then? From the base of it, 360 meters. Um, a couple minutes ago. So by the time we get on site, it will be about 330 meters away. Base of the fault, and the fault itself, that that scarp, is uh, about 100 meters across to get, get up to the top on the other side. So we have to make a choice about how far, because we we want to get want to get a measurement at the bottom, and get a measurement here on the top. Probably what that will move to the where the bottom is in the next one. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise it wouldn't make much more sense to just move another hundred meters and then 
Offset at all, right? But uh, that's an important hypothesis that we want to test. Mm -hmm. So yeah, stay stay to do that. Entonces serían la siguiente, cuando terminemos esta, la siguiente 200, 150 para la... Serían 150. Serían 150. Ahí y luego uno arriba. Son 100 metros. Sí. O sea, la falla. Ya cuando quieras, ¿eh? Sí, pero no se tarda mucho. Bueno, dale unos segundos a que empiece a hacerla y luego ya la... So what was the, the distance again? 230 meters. 
Okay, get from the Messina, please. Roger. I'm, I'm probably I'm trying to the de to decide. Just give me one yeah, two seconds. Si lo queremos hacer equidistante, pues 330 entre 2. Movemos esa distancia. ¿No? La otra opción es irnos hasta el escarpe. ¿Ves lo que dice? Que lo más importante es la paña. out that we do give them the third measurement yeah. and we just we jump on the other little side little. of the ball and I think two measurements on the other side of the ball right. are more valuable than two, two measurements before the, the ball. Yes, okay. I think so, so the next measurement, the next review will be all the way to the full scar. So that means 330 meters. That's 330 meters? Yes. Yeah, but let's not go quite that far because there's probably tailless at the bottom and it won't be soft. So okay. let's try going to 300 meters. I gotta it's not that dramatic. 
That's what we'll have. Yeah, you need, you need to know. Yeah, that's what's in front of me, so I can't. Uh, yeah, so maybe, uh, 15 meters. 15? Oh, Yeah. It's only, um, it's only a large scarf in relative terms. The right color map that looks impressive. <laughs> There you are, you're communicating with it with this guy. It's like you sign, wave to him and well, then he's saying, one time Okay, I see you. Chris was flying and okay, so we're trying to get a a handle on this ball. Put the arm out to grab onto it, and then we started working. And one of these squat lobsters came up to the hand, like its claws were out, and it was like the whole like, yeah, yeah. wow. Now, as I measure it, it's 70 meters, 70 meters up. All right. Yeah, let me know how far away. Yeah. It's well, what what I think is let's go 300. But um, if you start seeing bottom that looks like it's going to be hard to penetrate, let's stop and back up a little. Mm -hmm. and make sure that we're still in a place that we can take a picture. Okay. So that's starting for me. Okay. That's the base of it. We said three thirty, right? Let's get the crow out, please. Crow out. You're going to the end of this garden, so it's about to get 70 meter high or something like that. So that's where it's supposed to start. I want to bring the vessel to the stack. You should. It's about to go over. It's about 70 meters. Aren't they like? Are we ready to go? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. The spear.
yo no lo tengo, pero completamente olvidado. Ah, sí, yo es que ahora, gracias a Dios, no soy la que se encarga de los vlogs, entonces por eso ni siquiera te había recordado ni sabía. Ni me había acordado yo, yo ya, creo que ya dice que lo, hubiera, lo, lo debía haber hecho y entregado, o sea que... ¿Es con ¿Lo puedes hacer o, o ya no? ¿Ya estás ¿Sí? Ah, sí, 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 sí. Pero hoy tengo que decir a Hannah que va a ir tarde. Pues. Sí, antes no lo hubiera podido hacer. hacer. ¿Qué fotos necesitarías para el blog? Ok. Si te falta una foto de la Ok. So, Dara, are we all in agreement that uh, we do not want uh, Catholic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Eh, hicimos dos nada más, uno en, en donde fuimos primero al Marathon y luego uno en Diane Spine y ya. Ah, ok, pero sí, pero hoy se han hecho. Sí, 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 ah, dos. Ah, okay. Pero ya no, después de eso ya no. <laughs> you finally, you only took you one, they took you one. Why did see the first week we were in Cornell? Oh, yeah, that would be ¿Cómo mejoras una foto así? ¿Vale? ¿Cómo mejoras una foto que está así? Eh, yo le haría... Primero gustaría ver si no hay una donde no esté cortada, que me imagino que aquí debe haber algunas. Y segundas... ¿Estás en foto? Ah, sí. sí. No, no es Photoshop. No, es foto. Pero bueno, si quieres igual me lo puedes... Ah, bueno. A ver, nunca he usado eso, pero... Eh, es nada más un ejercicio, así como... Mira, curvas, yo diría curvas. Entonces, cuando tú veas las curvas... Lo que, todo lo que está a la izquierda y abajo es lo más negro de la foto y lo que está arriba y a la derecha es lo más claro de la foto y un truco súper fácil para mejorar casi cualquier cosa es que tú tienes tus curvas ahorita están así, este es tu recuadro de curvas y está así, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. que hagas una especie de S y te traes poquito los negros abajo y subes los... Uh -huh. entonces ya solo con eso le das más contraste y normalmente, pero como la foto está un poquito oscura, oscura uh -huh. yo, mira, te pones aquí encima y le subiría un poquitito, ¿ves? Me uh -huh. van subiendo las luces, pero ahora está un poco muy clara, entonces le bajo un poco los negros. 
para no perder ese contraste uh -huh. y a los medios también lo voy a subir un poquito no sé a ver si es antes y después uh -huh. sí, 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 sí. Okay. de todas formas lo único que siento es que perdimos no, no, no. iba a decir que perdimos un poco de la transparencia porque lo hicimos muy negro así que le voy a subir un poquito a los negros después ya uh -huh. se le ve un poco más Solo hacerle eso a las fotos normalmente ya las acuerdo. De acuerdo. Una S. Ok, uh -huh. gracias por el tip, hermoso. Thank you, guys.
Okay, guys, just hang on. It's a longer transit this time. We're going uh, from the last station all the way to what it's going to be, not necessarily the end of the transit, but near a, a fort, uh, fault scarp. So it's taking us a little bit longer to get there, but just hang in there and enjoy the view. The uh, scanning sonar is showing that there, there are some Where is the rocks scanning? and bits around on this report. 
So definitely got a program. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Well, depends on how adamant you are to get to that particular green spot. Do you want to shine? Do we care, or do we just want to find a soft spot? Do you want to find a soft spot? Yeah. So any place of us. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna scoot to this. Do you want to go back like ten or fifteen meters just because what we're seeing bloomy was quite a rough. Um, if that's your judgment as to where we can safely make the measurement, yes, I think so. And, um, Yeah, but, but I, I think let's. Around here that's, uh, should be okay, but just safe. let's poke first yes. as well, please. Oh, well, okay. Well, it was hard for the folk to go in. Oh, you think it's hard? No, I mean, it went in without it, a whole lot of light, whatever. It's, it's firmer it's, than the it's other. It's firmer, but it's okay. Okay, let's yeah. try. Yeah. I'm right. going slower, though. Okay. All right. So just um, looking at the terrain, you could see bits and pieces of rocks are all around. So that's because we are close to the scarp, the okay. false scarp. So we already poked the, the sediment and it seems it's, it's already, well, harder than we've seen in the past. So we're gonna do the insertion carefully here. So if you wanna take a look at the insertion, just look at the squid inset in your, in your screen.
Okay. All right. All Let's right. Try. Let's go. Sweet. Sweet, Chris. Woo. Yay. Yeah. All in. It's already, it's already hot, right? It's No creo, no. ¿Sí? Ok. Como like a red wing.
And interestingly, it, it, it looks like the heat flow here, at least the, the deepest temperature, is a little bit higher than it was back. So it looks like there is a signal associated with it, this fault idea, perhaps a, a solid one. It's another little fault break there that's actually a step up slightly. Um, that is a little, little uh, about 50 meters past here. That's so probably we're not. We're not there on the So the wall is the uh, same for the next leg, the sea, the sea and the Okay. And then Victoria and her team will come up. Okay. Well, we could chat. He says that he would skip. Let's put the probe out, please. On the probe out? Yep. Let's move to the probe Okay, guys, so we are navigating to our last spot. So we are at, uh, we were just now at the, um, at the bottom of a false scarp, and now we're navigating to the top of the scarp. So we're climbing a little hill here and trying to find another soft spot. As you could see, it's a rocky terrain, and so it's definitely harder to, for the probe to be inserted safely. And uh, regarding your your questions about the sediment temperature and the thermistor, yes, usually the, the lower the, the, the thermistor it is, it registers the higher temperature. So, yeah, you could say, Rachel, that yeah, uh, the 
the top monster mystery always uh, registers a lower temperature and as you go deeper um, the thermistor starts to uh, register higher temperatures. Oh, Michael, what you saw is the heat pulse that we fired when we are doing a complete measurement. So that was the second spike, um, but it, we interrupted it. So we got uh, just half of the measurement done here, and we're going to infer the second part. And um, we did that because we are limited on time here. So um, we want to make sure that we'll get that last measurement done today. Le puedes poner en la observación que estamos en el escarte o eh, estábamos subiendo el escarte de la falla.
Okay, guys, look at the scarf. It's, it's really amazing. Thank you, John. That was a fantastic idea. So we're going up the scarf and trying to get to the top of that scarf. So that's why it is so rocky here. So it's a fault. And so then the pilots are doing a great job navigating, um, going up slope. Yeah. Watching that rise closely gave me more seasickness than I've had this whole trip. <laughs> Feeling the motion. So we are at the top of the scarf and we're going to check uh, 
the terrain, the roughness of the terrain. So fingers crossed that we can insert the probe here. So it's Down. 
down. I bet that I think we can see those. Okay. Or, uh, Okay, going in. Yeah. What's that? It's fine. That's as far as I know. Yeah.
I grab the point to the It's inserted. Or inserted the rabbit. Yeah. This T, T5, the, the top one? Yeah, the top one. That's not it. That's, the, that's in the water. It's in the water. It's right. I, I thought that, but these should all be the same here, so you have to move those. Yeah. The, you have to move yeah, those, 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 those up, and then everything makes sense to me. But that was always my presumption, was oh, I needed to visually correct for the differences in the, the water temperature. It's important to do this because the material can easily be different up here.
six minutes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Before we go, don't you guys have to clean up your mess? <laughs> <laughs> I'll start just pulling it back in. <laughs> Depends where you are. <laughs> Every time we wander around Axial Sea now, all we see are, are all the Alvin dive boys and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to stay in here to where we're going to stay. It's about three more minutes. So. I did that earlier too, but it was a donut. <laughs> did you answer that the bottom question there? What? There's a question about the two parts of the temperature signal. The, the oh, no, I haven't seen that. Hi, Michael. It's an interesting question. Yes. Um, so during the first part of the measurement, the first spike that you see on the graph is actually the probe inserting itself in this, into the sediment, and um, that produces friction. And so from that decay, of uh, temperature in each in each thermistor, we um, calculate the thermal gradient, uh, the temperature gradient. Sorry, and on the second spike, we fire a heat pulse, 
through a heat wire that it's uh, inserted in, in between the thermistors inside the probe. And then we observe the decay for seven minutes. And during that time, we can um, calculate the uh, thermal conductivity and yeah, diffusive, thermal diffusivity and um, specific heat, all the thermal properties of the sediment. So there are some, sometimes we choose not to do the whole measurement because the thermal conductivity in this area doesn't vary too much and it saves time for us and we can do more, uh, more measurements uh, using a, an inferred conductive um, thermal conductivity. So I hope okay. that helps. Ready? Coming up. Ready. Yes. Thank you. We're done. Sweet. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for waiting. That Thank this you. was an important measurement. Tell Lisa that the schedule tomorrow is the same. Yeah. Okay, guys, so as the pilots prepare to uh, start coming up, just to thank you for being with us for another exciting dive. Uh, we accomplished a lot today as well, so thank you for your comments and uh, for making this time in the science room. Uh, fun for us as well and I think it's uh, informative for you guys as well even though it's not a biology leg and I know you are almost all of you are biology lovers but thank you for sticking around so Lisa the schedule yes is the same for tomorrow so we will start the, the we will have the ROV at 8 30 in the water starting the descent so we're going back to the Jack Ma Jack Benfield tomorrow for finishing up the heat flow transfer that we're doing. Uh, that's a north-south heat flow transfer, and we were discovering really high, um, really a nice um, information, new information that what we were inspecting. So tune up for tomorrow. It will be the last dive in Pescadero Basin, and then we will head up to our port called in La Paz, and the science leg will begin on uh, um, October the 28th. So you can expect probably the first dive to be on the 29th. Um, because the first day is always about the, the drills on the ship, 
getting everybody into place and then transiting uh, the way all the way back to here okay so thank you again and have a nice rest of your afternoon and it's a weekend so enjoy see you tomorrow